was buried beneath my shame. And who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing but not alive And all my failures I tried to hide It was my tomb Till I met you Cause when you call my name I ran out of the darkness into your glorious day you called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day
of our offering as your saints bow down as your people sing we will rise with you lifted on your wings and the world will see that our god saves our god saves there is hope in your In the name of the Spirit, Lord, we come. We're gathered together to lift up your name, to call on our Savior, to fall on your grace. Hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down, as your people sing. We will rise with you lifted on your wings. The world will see that our God saves, our God saves, there is hope in your name, morning turns to songs of the joyful sound and hear the joyful sound of our offering as your saints bow down as your people sing we will rise with you lifted on your wings and the world will see that and yes the world will see that our God saves continue to worship you. Philippians 2 says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, that at the name, the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Excuse me. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Jesus, let us worship you this morning. There was a moment when the lights went out, when death had claimed its victory. 
king of love had given up his life the darkest day in history there on the cross they made for sinners for every curse his blood atoned one final breath and it was finished but not the end we could have known for the earth began to shake and the veil was torn what sacrifice was made as the heavens
our song shall rise to Thank you today for lots of things, but that song, what an amazing hymn, that chorus that is newer, the combination. Lord, the truth of how holy you are, how majestic and powerful. Thank you, God, for the way it speaks to us. Remind us today that no matter what is happening in our lives, what is happening in our family, in our community, in our world, that you are awesome and holy, and powerful. There will be a day when all of the craziness is done, 
And maybe that will be because you've come back and you've taken your church with you and you've established your reign on earth. Lord, that would be an awesome thing. Except, God, we have work to do before that happens and they, we have loved ones that need Jesus and we have neighbors and we have people that, that desperately need to know Christ. And so remind us that in these moments you may be coming back soon. So prepare us, change us, help us to be obedient to you. Help us to be about the mission of reaching people, we pray. Cause the church, not just our church, but the church in America, the church in the world to rise up, to be powerful. Thank you for the places where it is growing so rapidly. I think of places like uh, in Africa, and just the amazing growth. I think of the underground church in China just doing amazing thing. And even in the 1040 window, there are places where you're just breaking free. And so we pray that you would continue that. And we pray that in Europe and in America and in Canada, Lord, that those things would happen once again. And so God, use this crazy time to stir the church up, we pray. We pray for our leaders. We ask, God, that you would help them to follow you. We pray that they would hear your voice. We pray for leaders on both sides of the aisle that, Lord, this time wouldn't be just about re-election, but it would be about doing what is best for our country. Lord, we think of the, the ongoing violence, especially right now in Wisconsin. Oh, God, we need you to help us in this country to put an end to racism. We pray that you would help us to put an end, Lord, to defying authority. We pray, God, that all of those things that you just need to sort that out and work, and that means a revival in our country. We pray, we pray, God, for people whose hearts need to be changed. Be with our leaders. Be with the leaders in Wisconsin and other places. Be with our leaders here in, in Texas, we pray. Be with our church leaders globally and our local um, church leaders as a church and our West Texas, our district superintendent. God, give them grace and wisdom, we pray. God, we pray for our local church. Thank you, Lord, for how you're helping us even in these days of of the pandemic. We thank you for people who have given faithfully and our ability to be able to move forward. We thank you and praise you. We, we thank you for outreach that is happening, for people that are speaking to their neighbors, that are people that are logging on and viewing uh, the ministry online. Thank you for all of that. Today we pray for our church fellowship and some people who are hurting. Uh, Lord, as we heard of Bernadine's home going, what a wonderful lady she was, how encouraging she was to me personally, how many prayers she prayed for me. And as I would visit her, Lord, how she just lifted my spirits. Thank you that she's in heaven. Be with her family as they gather for a, a small graveside service. We pray that you would help them. We pray today for Zola in this a difficult surgery. We pray that you would encourage her. We pray that you would protect her, help her body to reject infection and to make it through this tough time. And uh, Lord, get her back to feeling well. We pray for Kathy Ryer. And Lord, as she is battling, um, Lord, this disease that we just, we're just so tired of hearing about people with cancer. We pray that you would help her and Lord, there are others that are still battling. We pray that you would be with each of those. And Lord, there's unspoken requests people have. Would you touch them? Would you hear their prayers? Would you encourage their faith? Would you work with their families and their finances and jobs? And Lord, just all of these things, we pray, God, that you would answer so many prayers. We're so glad that you know all about them the things that are public and the things that are very private in the deep parts of our hearts. Thank you for working. And for all of these things, Lord, we'll thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
I'm thankful today for so many things. I'm thankful today to hear um, our treasurer's report that uh, last Sunday was great and God is helping us. And I'm, I, I really appreciate all of you who have given faithfully, made sure you sent your tithes in, you've logged on to our website. If you've not, we encourage you to do that. Thank you for those who are inviting their friends to view um, our online service. And for those who came out last week, and uh, we had a great time. It was awesome to be back together. And so uh, we encourage you, um, as you feel comfortable, to come and join us in person, but keep watching online. So thank you uh, for being uh, so faithful. And we pray for one another, and I hope you are reaching out and praying for each other. We're in a series on the Big Ten, and we're talking about the Ten Commandments. And one of the things that we see in our modern society is that generally, or increasingly, Americans especially are rejecting the whole idea of commandments. We don't like to be told, you can't do this. And we are looking at the Ten Commandments through our own filter, through how it affects us. And so what we've discovered is people are saying, I like this one, I don't like this one. They're reinterpreting this one. They're, and wow, this whole series has to, be, has to go back to the principle that we don't get to tell God what we're going to agree with. He's God, and so we just need to submit and allow Him to be Lord and we need to be obedient. And so as we look at these, that old-fashioned principle still holds. You know, if you ask people what the most important commandment was, most would probably say, do not murder. That, that's the, probably the one that everybody goes, yep, that's still good. But some of the other ones they'd be really fuzzy on. And the one we talk about today would probably be the most fuzzy. In fact, if you went out into the public and began to ask people, what do you think about the commandment to keep the Sabbath? They would probably get an expression on their face that is puzzled or maybe frustrated or even irritated, and they would say, what's the Sabbath? Or maybe they would say, if they understood the Ten Commandments, they, they would say something like, is keeping the Sabbath still a thing? Is it still a commandment? I thought we were way, way past that. And others would just say, why? Why is it even a commandment? We just, we don't even get why that's in here. And often in the church, we don't understand it. And so we are going to try our very best to help apply it to our world and to our lives today. One of the things that I would say to our reluctance to listen or abide by commandments at all is the fact that God knows us best and he has a plan for our lives and these commandments aren't for our harm, they are for our good. Listen to how the psalmist in Psalm 19 says it. God's laws are perfect. They protect us, make us wise, and give us joy and light. God's laws are pure, eternal and just. They are more desirable than gold, for they warn us away from harm and give success to those who obey them. Man, I wish we could get that in our minds, even in the church, that if we abide by God's laws, if we obey God's laws, we will be blessed. If we disobey them, there will be brokenness. There will be consequences. We don't get to change them. We don't get to rewrite them. We don't get to take some of them out. We simply need to obey. And that principle is so important. When we obey, it brings God's blessing and his protection. When we disobey, we find ourselves broken. Often what God does is just he re pulls back his protection and he just allows us to have the consequences of our choices and that always results in brokenness. These commandments and all of his are made to help us, to give us joy and peace and make life easier. Let's go through these commandments 
You can read them with me. I'll be reading them um, in a contemporary version. Uh, Jonna has sent these out, and you can uh, memorize them, whether you are a kid or an adult, memorize them. Number one, do not worship any other God than the one true God. Number two, do not make idols or images in the form of God. Number three, do not treat God's name with disrespect. And our commandment for today, dedicate a regular day each week for Sabbath rest and worship of the Lord. Actually, this, uh, this law, this commandment is really long. So let me just read it in its entirety. Remember that the Sabbath day belongs to me. You have six days when you can do your work, but the seventh day of each week belongs to me, your God. No one is to work on that day, not you, your children, your slaves, your animals, or the foreigners who live in your towns. In six days I made the sky, the earth, the oceans, and everything in them, but on the seventh day I rested. That's why I made the Sabbath a special day that belongs to to me. Some interesting things about this commandment that are different than the others. First of all, this one's positive. There are two that are positive and the eight that are negative, the thou shalt nots. This one is positive. The other one is honoring your father and your, mom, your mother. It also begins very differently. Instead of thou shalt not or do not, which is an imperative, it's harsh, it's pointed, it's negative. This is positive, and it begins with the word remember, or don't forget. Let me remind you, that's a completely different feel than the others that say, you shall not, or you can't do this. Think of it this way. You have an employee who keeps being late to work, and the boss finally comes and says, don't be late once again or you won't have a job. That's a thou shalt not. That's very different than saying to your son or daughter or spouse, remember the car's low and gas don't forget to go get gas. You see, that's a huge difference. And as we try to apply this, as we try to figure this, how this applies to us and, and what's God trying to say, we need to be able to make the distinction between remember and thou shalt not, because it sets a complete different tone. Can you imagine some, some of the other, uh, some of the other commandments being phrased as remember? Can you imagine telling your kids as, as they go out the door, remember not to kill someone today, or remember not to rob a bank. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. But there's a difference. Thou shalt not rob a bank, thou shalt not kill, but remember to keep the Sabbath day and make it holy. See, apparently keeping the Sabbath is easy to forget. It is something that we constantly have to be reminded of, and so he, he uses um, a different phrase. But in spite of the fact that he says, remember, in spite of the fact that it's positive instead of negative, it's not this harsh imperative, it still is a commandment. It isn't a suggestion, and it's for our good, so keeping the Sabbath is a commandment. As as scholars study this, they, they often see this commandment as a transition. So we have the first three about the lordship of God. Don't have any other gods. Um, don't make images of a god and worship them. And don't, don't misuse or misrepresent, disrespect God's name. And then you come to this one, which connects to that because he says, this is my day. It's, it's how um, I honor it, and so you have to honor it. So it connects to the lordship of God, but it really connects to the practical day-by-day -day living. And so it says, you know what? You've got to have a day a week. You've, you've got to have time where you worship, where you rest, where you renew. And so it is a commandment that is transitional. What's also interesting is it's, it's not only a commandment, but it is a sign See, for Israel, this was one of many 
signs, indicators that they were God's people. And so, like the men were circumcised, this was keeping the Sabbath, was a sign of what it meant to be Jewish. And they had all kinds of other holidays, and they didn't eat this, and there was just all these things. This was one of those signs that they were followers. They were God's children. And so it is a commandment, but it is also a sign. Sabbath, of course, means to stop and rest. Sabbath is a rest day, and it is used from the beginning to the end of the Bible. It is often in there. It's one of the Ten Commandments. It's reinforced uh, all through the Bible. Of course, when we get to talking about Jesus, he, he transitions it into a principle that is wrapped up in following him, but it is still a commandment. It is still one of the things that uh, we need to uh, remember. The Jews kept forgetting and they kept getting in trouble for it. And you know what? We will be broken. It will affect our lives if we neglect this principle of keeping the Sabbath. Something else that as you dig into this, keeping the Sabbath is an aid to our holiness. It helps us be holy. It enables us to walk this journey of life in a positive and Christ-like way. It is a support system. The, the keeping the Sabbath is this huge thing that will help us actually accomplish our goal, and that's to be like Jesus. You say, how does it do that? Maybe Paul in chapter 12 of Romans says it best. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold, but let God remold your minds from within so that you may prove in practice that the plan of God for you is good, meets all his demands, and moves toward the goal of true maturity. That's the J.B. Phillips translation, and, and I love that. The truth is, Paul nailed it. We are living in a world that is constantly trying to remold us, trying to squeeze us into the value structure of our world. Uh, our world doesn't want us to be shining brightly for Jesus. It, it, it puts them under conviction. It, it changes the landscape. And so we just keep getting pressure over and over again from every side, from people, from television, from entertainment. It's just a constant, constant pressure to focus on the here and now and on the materialistic. The stuff of this world we are being told over and over again will make you happy, will bring you peace, will help you have a great life. So focus your attention on getting the stuff of this world and, and just getting all the gusto you can from this life because that's all there is. We're being told that the kind of car you drive will make or break your personal satisfaction. The kind of house you live and what kind of furniture and the accessories you have and where you vacation, all of those kinds of things of the here and now are essential to experiencing real life. And in spite of that, the Word of God says that stuff passes away. And so it's the Sabbath principle that helps us keep eternity and eternal perspectives and the plan of God for our lives in our focus. It is an important thing. See, what's, what's interesting is we have a world where people are selling their souls for the here and now and all the stuff of this world thinking that it'll make them happy. And when they get more and more of the stuff, they realize they're not any happier than they were before. In fact, the things that they let go of in order to sell their soul for this stuff of this world, those are the things that they forgot along the way and let go that would have actually made them happy. And so at the end of life, and all the people that I've prayed with as they've gone from this life to the next life. I've never had anyone say, you know, I really wish I'd have bought the higher model car when, no, they never say that. Oh, I wish I'd have gotten that boat, or I wish, no, no, they, they talk about how they wish they'd spent more time on eternal things. They'd spent more time in relationship building. They'd, 
they'd listen to God in practical ways more. It's the Sabbath that helps us focus and see in perspective the things that are most important. And so the Sabbath brings life into God's perspective. It provides rest and joy and security for eternity for sure, but also for the here and now. Well, something else. The Sabbath, keeping the Sabbath is a principle. And, and let, me, let me help us understand what this means. Jesus makes it clear that all the commandments are wrapped up in his life. So that if Jesus is living in our hearts and we are following him, we never have to worry that we are violating a commandment. Because if we're following Jesus, everything is a go as far as keeping God's commandments. He, he said this, Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. When we follow Jesus, we will accomplish God's plan and his purpose for our lives. The contemporary English version says it this way. I did not come to do away with them, but to give them their full or complete meaning. Now see... The religious leaders of Jesus' day did not like him saying these things about any of the commandments. And he spent a lot of time, the Sermon on the Mount, you've heard it was said, well, I'm telling you, and so he began to redefine it. They didn't like that at all. Who does he think he is? But on the Sabbath, they were particularly irritated because he violated all the rules uh, that they had put in place to keep the Sabbath. Remember... The word leading into this commandment is remember, not thou shalt not. So we have this distinct difference. This is a remember, don't forget to. This will help you if you, instead of don't you dare do this. So it is a very distinct difference. And Jesus began to live that way. He began to make the Sabbath a remember, a principle that will help your life, a principle that will give fulfillment. But the religious leaders had a thou shalt not, and thou shalt not. Thou shalt not walk this far, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt... And they had over and over again, they had turned the principle of remember the Sabbath into a harsh, negative, imperative command and Jesus was trying to take it back to God's original purpose for the Sabbath that would bring joy and peace instead of, be, instead of being a legalistic rule to follow. And so Jesus says things like, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. Oh, they hated that. That put him on the level of God, which he said he was, and he got crucified for that. But he said, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. And then he proceeded with his disciples. He encouraged them to break their laws about the Sabbath. And so it just, just bugged him. After he died and resurrected, all of that transitioned so that they no longer kept Saturday as their Sabbath. They had a resurrection day. And so soon the New Testament church was so transitioning away from the thou shalt not that they were calling their Sabbath Sunday resurrection day. And they had totally turned it around just like Jesus was trying to get them to do. Now I grew up, as I said last week, I grew up in a pretty conservative, a very loving, a very godly. And my parents were the real deal, but they were very traditional and very conservative. And one of the ways that that played out was the how we keep the Sabbath holy. So I grew up, and in, in the churches we went to generally, there was this thou shalt not mindset about the Sabbath. Thou shalt not eat out on Sunday. And so we never did. Thou shalt not buy gas on Sunday. So you planned ahead or you ran out of gas. Thou shalt not get a Sunday newspaper. That was way before the internet. Thou shalt not play organized sports 
on Sunday. And on and on the list go, and, and my parents were gracious and kind, but we certainly were required to adhere to this thou shalt not. And so Sabbath keeping, as I grew up, was not about the principle, remember, it was the thou shalt not have any fun. That's how I looked at it as a kid. I remember after graduating from high school and I went to Mount Vernon Nazarene College, now a university, and uh, I was in a singing group and we were a PR group for the college and, and I remember those early days, we were out nearly every weekend for four years singing and so often on Sundays we were taken out to eat. So the early days when I had grown up being in the home thinking you don't go out to eat on Sunday, now all of a sudden the Nazarene pastor is taking us out to eat on Sunday. Man, there was this twinge of guilt and what if God comes back now? Here I am in a restaurant on Sunday and oh man, it, it took me a while to work through having grown up under Sabbath keeping as Thou shalt not do this, 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 and this. Instead of, remember this principle. Allow it to renew you. Allow it to cause rest. Allow it to build you up. It was a completely, completely different thing. Thankfully, I, I, I got over it, and pretty soon I didn't think about it. But, but every now and then it would rear its ugly head. One of the illustrations that I've used, uh, the story, true story, was when we bought a house in, when we were at Warren First Church. We'd been there about 10 years, and we bought this house. It was two and a half acres, and we had lots of grass to mow. I mean, a lot of grass to mow, and even more weed whacking. Well, one of the things that Penny especially liked was to get on that uh, Cub Cadet 20 horsepower tractor and just mow for hours. It would get away from kids because they were, you know, being kids and driving her nuts and she'd get on there and she'd mow for hours and that was great. Now, what she didn't like to do is get the weed whacker out and weed whack for hours. I, I'm not sure what the deal was there. That got to be us guys' job. But anyway, so one Sunday afternoon, I'm coming home from church, and I had a meeting, or I had something to do, a call to make something, and when I came home on Sunday afternoon, I drove in the driveway, we're out in the country, and there's Penny just having a great time on the Cub Cadet. She's just mowing around, mowing around, and she's having a great time, and she didn't sing, but she was, just, she was just enjoying it, and I remember all of a sudden, all that stuff from my childhood, and then... What if some of our conservative church people drive by and there's the pastor's wife in shorts, no less, mowing grass on Sunday? So I went out to her and, and I had a little bit of the thou shalt not attitude. And she was functioning on the remember this principle. And as we talked about it, obviously she was right. She said, you know what, this is how I get away from the kids. This is my rest. I love doing this. This isn't hard work at all. Now, if you put me on the weed whacker, I don't ever want to do that, let alone on Sunday. But on Sunday, this is a restful, renewing time. And so I had to realize, you know what, if some uh, traditionalist drives by and gets grumpy, they're just going to have to be grumpy because they're living under a thou shalt not instead of a Remember this principle and apply it to your life. It will help you. Well, what's the principle then of the Sabbath? The principle is this. God wants us as his followers, as his children, to live every day here and now in constant physical, spiritual, emotional, and mental rest. You say, that's not possible. No, that's why he died. That's why the Holy Spirit has been given. And if we will engage the principle of the Sabbath rest, we will, we can experience peace in the midst of craziness. We can experience rest in the midst, in the midst of the tensions that are happening all over our world. The writer to the Hebrews in chapter 4 says it like this. So there is a special rest still waiting for the people of God. For all who have entered into God's rest 
have rested from their labors just as God did after creating the world. So let us do our best to enter that rest. But if we disobey God as the people of Israel did, we will fall. The message says it this way. The promise of arrival and rest is still there for God's people. God himself is at rest. And at the end of the journey, we'll surely rest with God. So let's keep at it and eventually arrive at the place of rest, not drop out through some sort of disobedience. If we are grumpy, if we are stressed out, if we are feeling pulled in every direction, it is a sure sign that we are not practicing the principle of Sabbath rest. And we need to step back. We, we need to change something so that we can enter again the rest, the peace. Because he doesn't want us living frazzled and on the edge and without peace. That's not his plan for our lives. Now I know some of you who love to study the word of God are going to say, oh no, he's talking only about going to heaven. Well, he is talking about heaven. And it is true that when we die in Christ and we hear those words, welcome home, uh, enter into my rest, we will enter into heaven and the tensions of this life, the temptations of this life, the, the stresses and the hassles will all be gone and we will live in perpetual peace and rest and worship and all of those other things that are just hard for us to imagine. But the writer isn't simply talking about a rest someday by and by. He's talking about a reality of living in the presence of God and having the Spirit of God, in spite of what the world throws at us, in spite of what happens in our families, in spite of what our kids do, in spite of what happens at the job, in spite of what the doctor says about our health, we can experience rest and peace instead of going crazy because he has rest for his children. God wants us to experience that. Now, maybe someone else will say, well, yeah, we, so that means we need to go to church because they equate the, the, the Sabbath rest with going to church. And that's one of the problems that we have perpetuated, one of the myths that we've perpetuated within the church. And truthfully, us pastors in the past have been as guilty of that uh, as possible. See, we approached this, what was supposed to be a rest, a Sabbath rest, from a point of program and a thou shalt. And so we have twisted arms and we said, you know what, you need to be in Sunday school and you need to be in worship and you need to go to committees and Sunday night is a, a mandate and Wednesday night and revival and any other time the pastor says you be there, you've got to be there. And I grew up doing all of those things. When the doors were open at the Free Methodist Church and then later the Nazarene Church, we were there. We were at Sunday school. We were at church. We were Sunday night. And if we had meetings, we were there. And if there was a revival, we were there. And there isn't anything essentially wrong with that. But we were operating under a thou shalt not miss church mindset instead of a remember this principle because I want you to experience peace and joy. Completely different things. And as, you know, as I began to grow in my faith and study the word and especially begin to, to study um, theology and stuff at, at Mount Vernon, I, I began to develop this, this awareness that in church we had actually caused people to violate the commandment by all of the stuff we were asking them to do. And, and that was you know, growing up in a conservative, here's what you do, thou shalt not, and, you know, the doors are open, you got to be there, and if the grass needs mowed, the nickel's got to do it, and, and, and that, that sense of obligation, uh, and not principle, not the remember. And so, as a young senior pastor, going to a Warren First Church, and, you know, and going through the plan that had been there, but increasingly believing that the busyness was actually a breaking 
of this principle of Sabbath rest. It wasn't just, oh, I don't like Sunday night. It was, I think this may be causing people to break the fourth commandment. And so after several years, uh, the place and in the discussions and through committees, we said, we're no longer going to do that. And we're going to try to be careful about pounding our people. And we're going to try to begin to, to lessen the busyness that, that is from the standpoint of thou shalt not. Now, that doesn't mean that Sunday night's necessarily wrong. There are life groups that they say, you know, this is the best time. This gives, uh, this gives uh, renewal to us. We want to meet. That's awesome. Provided it's coming from a remember the principle instead of you better be at church on Sunday night. Before COVID came and disrupted our whole lives, Pastor Mike, Mark would lead a gospel sing once a month, and that was a time of rest and, and, and relaxation, relaxation and renewal, especially for our senior adults, and they had fellowship. fellowship. That's fine. But it was coming from, uh, remember the Sabbath principle, instead of, you'd better be there on Sunday night. I hope you can see the difference. What Jesus brought was, back to what God originally intended, the principle of rest, instead of pushing people to go crazy and busy. And actually, that's one of the things I'm so thankful about COVID. It has made us cancel that. We might be, we might be far more biblical not doing all of these things than that we were ever before because we were doing the program that thou shalt, you'd better be here for this. So some would say, well, well we have to be on, on church on Sunday. What if somebody has to work? The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 14 was clear. One person observes Sunday, one Saturday, one another day. Friends, it's the principle. It's the principle. It's not the actual day. God needs to help us to get back to observing the principle of Sabbath rest. Well, let me leave you with these three very simple ways you can do that. Number one, commit to a daily time of Bible reading and prayer. See, rest and peace comes in the presence of God. And if you go days without that, you will be stressed, you will be sucked in, squeezed into the mold of the world, harried, running here and there. Uh, you've just regularly got to have this time of refocusing and allowing the Spirit of God to help you see the agenda of your daily life through the lens of rest and God's plan instead of the here and now, what will I get out of this? So a daily time of Bible reading and prayer. Secondly, commit to a weekly time of worship and meeting with God's people for Bible study and fellowship. It's just essential. It's, it's a renewing thing. It's a revival. It, is, it, it helps refocus us. The fellowship and the being with the family of God is, is just so helpful. And thirdly, Commit to daily physical renewal. See, half of this whole principle was about our bodies. It's about our bodies and our spirit. And if you just do one without the other, you're neglecting it. So those who say, my, man, my Sabbath, I'm out fishing. Well, that's one half of the equation, but you need the other half, and that is the spiritual renewal. And I know you can be renewed while you're fishing, but there is at some point a need to be committed to the family of God. But then there's other people that they're just not committed to the physical renewal. And that is just as important because we are whole people and God wants us to experience Sabbath rest in the entirety of our lives. Well, would you bow your heads with me? Very practical sermon, hopefully. My guess is the Holy Spirit is prodding at one point or another, saying You've, you're kind of living harried, going crazy, and you need to step back and you need to experience rest.
And so there needs to be a new commitment. Right now, you need to say, God, whatever I need to do to change my life so that I can experience your rest, then I need to do that. And the Holy Spirit will guide you and help you. He's more, more than capable. Those three simple commitments, a commitment to daily praying, spending time in God's presence. Now, the cool thing is you can combine some of these things. You know how often I ride my bike and I have earplugs in, uh, in just one ear so that I can hear what's going on around me, but I'm listening to scripture or devotional there are people who walk and, and pray. There's all kinds of ways you can do this. It, you don't deal with it as a remember to, not a thou shalt. You've got to do it this way. If you're operating your devotions that way, you're missing the principle of it. Make a commitment to the principle of being in God's presence and praying and reading the word or listening to the word. A, a weekly time of renewal in worship and Bible study and fellowship and some kind of physical renewal because God made your body and wants you to honor him with it. Jesus, we all need to do better in some areas of this, and I pray that as people are listening mostly and hopefully to you instead of just me, and that you would guide them to the kind of changes that need to be made in their life so that they can experience the joy and experience the restoration and the renewal of Sabbath rest. The changes that need to be made, I pray that you would give us courage to make those changes. In your name we pray, amen.